to be very blunt, if uh, if the small pool of, of exploration geologists and, and miners who we have in this industry weren't around, basically civilization would not have all the, the luxuries it does today. Everything, everything that you have in your possession either has to be mined or grown. I mean, it's that simple. Welcome to Talking Hidden Treasures, the official podcast, the Stockpulse.com production, Hunting Hidden Treasures. Here with me today, Dr. Quinn Henney of Crestcat Capital to talk about his experience as a treasure hunter. Quinn is a globally renowned exploration geologist with 30 plus years in precious metals and mining experience. Dr. Quinn Henney, appreciate you taking the time here and uh, I certainly set you up here. A lot of experience, my friend. So the obvious question here is what made Dr. Quinn Henney become a treasure hunter? You know, I, I kind of learned at an early age. I grew up partly here in Colorado, and uh, a lot of people around me uh, kind of had some passion for mining. My grandfather, he was actually a farmer, but he liked to go up on the weekends. So I'd go up on the weekends with him. We go prospecting and stuff. Uh, go to a lot of the old mines, and uh, kind of fell in love with with the whole concept that you could actually dig, you know, money up metal out of the ground like gold. And uh, about when I was 16, basically, when I became legal age to work in a gold mine, I went to work for the uh, the local gold mine here called Across in the Caribou Mines up at uh, up above Nederland, Colorado, for Tom Hendricks. So I got got to start very very early. So what as being a treasure hunter, what makes you good at your craft? What really what really lights your fire is looking for uh, all this hidden, hunting hidden treasure so far below Earth's crust. You know, it's uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, discovery is is an easy one to get hooked on. You wanna you wanna go out there and find something. It's not just about finding you know something worth a, a lot of money, but it's actually proving your theory right or proving your uh, a concept right around the geology and what the geology is telling you, and uh, you know ultimately making that discovery. That's that's what's key here. It's just it's like kind of like fishing or a lot of things where you're you know, you're casting a line in the water and you're hoping that you, you land a big one. Same with, with mining and exploration. You're, you know, it's a little bit longer process. You don't just throw a, a line and a sinker out in the water, but, uh, you know, it, it over two or three years, you, you want to prove up your concept. You want to develop your targets and test them and, and hopefully prove them right. Yeah, so along those lines, um, you guys have been afforded a lot of new technology since you uh, started the game. So um, uh, talk about those a little bit and how those have improved your odds of moving forward, or have they? They they have, actually. Look, uh, there's a lot of uh, geophysical techniques that have really advanced over the past few years. You know, back uh, 20 years ago, it was a bit touch and go with a lot of geophysics you, you get results back and there'd be, you know, kind of anomalies of red blobs and blue blobs, and, you know, like say, where, where do you drill? And today what I'm finding is these anomalies more and more are, are becoming more clear as far as, uh, you know, defining some, uh, having a context in the geology, I guess is the best way to put it. Like you can actually see and rationalize the geology in the subsurface from the geophysical evidence. And that's been a huge, huge leap for, for the exploration community. I think uh, a lot of uh, disco more discoveries are being made because of the advances in geophysics, but there's also other advances. Uh, geochemical exploration techniques are improving also dramatically uh, very quickly. There's a lot of uh, you know stream sediment analyses or types of analyses that uh, are very effective, like leg sampling. It's very effective at identifying metal anomalous areas, not just gold, but a lot of different metals. And then we have uh, new techniques that are popping up all the time, uh, some of which you know are, are deep uh, searching geochemical techniques that appear to be proving uh, very fruitful. So yes, uh, we're in a, a, a good period in exploration in that as we found most of the shallow near surface deposits, we're now moving in into a uh, technical space in which it's allowing us to make more and more deeper discoveries. So I do anticipate the next generation, uh, you know, exploration to produce a whole host of deposits, to discoveries uh, that are blind. Yeah, I'm sure you could uh, write a book on this next one, but uh, what makes a good project? I and mean, really, how do you identify one? 
you know, the, the, the key to identifying a good product is to have a really good understanding of the system you're dealing with and the scale of, of the system. You want to, you want to understand what defines a big system versus a small system. Okay. And you got to think in the third dimension. It's not just about how, how extensive it is laterally, like its surface, but you also now have to think more uh, vertically too, because a lot of the deposits, like I said, that we're going to discover over the next few years uh, are going to have to be blind discoveries. You know, a lot of the easy stuff is gone. So uh, I, I focus on scale. I focus on making sure the companies that I work with have a consolidated land position. Uh, I don't like to see companies that have just picked a, you know, small part of a bigger system, for example. Uh, I like to see uh, companies that that are really thinking outside of the box and willing to test new techniques, geophysical and geochemical techniques. You know, it's it's kind of a combination of a lot of things, but scale is critical. You want to find it, it look, it takes just as much time and effort and money to go explore for something small as it is for something big, to be frank. You might as well explore for something big. So your elephant hunt, I, I get that. Um, so so here, here's the here's the the other question here. When and I see this, I don't know how common. I guess you'll tell me. But when is it time to cut a project loose? Um, I see companies sometimes just just working at something, and maybe there's just nothing there. And I think the the nature of the junior mining game is shouldn't it be on to the next? There's plenty of other targets to test. If you if it doesn't hit a certain criteria, you're going to keep going on it, or what, what's your philosophy there? Look, there, there are a lot of projects that have been around the block. They've either been in the hands of previous companies, and now they're in the hands of a company that's, you know, effectively not doing much new. Uh, but then there's other companies that that have found things through grassroots work and or or taken existing projects and advanced them in a meaningful way. The way I look at the projects is really there's three three ways they can move forward as more and more data is collected. Uh, if you see the trend is is upwards, you know, every time you see more data come in and it says, hey, this thing's getting bigger, better, you know, there's more to test here. There's it's you know open in more directions than we thought, all of those good things, then those are the ones you want to stick with. Okay. So I, I keep track of the data. And as long as that trend is upwards, those are the ones, those are usually the winners. Uh, there are also ones that pretty much go horizontal. In other words, as data comes in, it's not really building much of a story. It's kind of telling you it is what it is, and that's that's all to expect. Then there's the ones that go down. You know, as you do more and more work, the uh, the assays don't quite prove to be what you thought, or the the system is cut off by a fault, or you know whatever. There's a lot of negative in, in, information that can pop up. Those are the ones you want to cut you know, cut and run. So, uh, you know, look, you have to watch these things on a routine basis. You can't just sit there and, you know, be a kind of a static investor in the exploration space. You got to monitor and watch these junior companies very closely so that you make sure that you understand the data that's coming in and the overall trend it's telling you. And if, if, they're, if the trend is positive, those are the ones you want to stick with. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about uh, where to work. Um, uh, Nevada comes up uh, a lot on the Fraser Institute, uh, friendliest places to be. Um, where's uh, where's Quentin Henny like to be? Yeah, look, I like to go to areas uh, first of all, safe jurisdictions first and foremost. Uh, spending money and you know investing in com- countries or local jurisdiction states, for example, here in the U.S. That's simply don't have a track record of building mines, have a hostile political environment, so forth, not a good place to spend money. So we focus on putting money into safe jurisdictions. Uh, you know, we look at things like the Fraser Institute survey and so forth. Uh, but also we look at places where, you know, there is a track record of building mines. That's that's uh, that's a key. Uh, what do I also look for? Geology, obviously, you know, where where is the gold? Where is the silver? Where is whatever metal you're looking for? Uh, it doesn't do a lot of good to go off to uh, to a location that just doesn't have, uh, you know, district scale potential or large scale potential. Again, uh, you focus on 
spending your time and effort looking for big things, not necessarily small things. So I like to look in areas of the crust that are well endowed, uh, like the Golden Triangle and regions around around that area in the British uh, in British Columbia, uh, Nevada certainly. Nevada is uh, well endowed. Many parts of South America, Peru, uh, Bolivia, Brazil. Uh, you know, these are all good places to be. Peru's a little dodgy jurisdictionally right now, but. Uh, but, you know, I think places like Bolivia, for example, well-endowed area and the po- politics are improving. So that's uh, that's actually one of the places we've started to look more and more lately. Yeah. So um, if you had to um, give a few of those uh, attaboys to some companies that are doing it right out there, um, anyone really ticking your radar? Uh, as far as companies doing it right, look, uh, there's, there's a lot of companies that have, uh, I'm going to call it we'll call it new discoveries and they they've done a lot of very good science. You know, I, I give uh, our crew there at Ascape mining uh, accolades for that, like the, the work that they've done to define the, uh, the TV and Jeff targets that are, are certainly coming up Trump's as well as some of the new VMS targets. Those that's, a, that's really good science behind that. Uh, you know, other stories look, uh, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, Scott bird all up at uh up at Snowline in the Yukon uh, property that a year ago nobody had ever heard of, but now it looks like they have maybe two major discoveries in one drill season. I mean, that's that's phenomenal uh, work, phenomenal uh, science that's behind it. Uh, Kenorland, I saw some more results coming out of them recently. Those guys are very sharp, uh, technical team, very you know, very capable explorers. Uh, I like uh, Dustin Berry and his team there at uh, Kingfisher, for example. I think they're doing a good job. Early stage, the results weren't the results so far haven't been quite what everybody wanted, but I think there's still a great deal of promise on that property. And and sometimes you know discoveries are seldom made in the first hole or two. They're usually made in the the twentieth or thirtieth or fiftieth hole. You know so. Uh, look, it's really exciting. I guess if I had to sum it up, it's exciting to see some young people come in to this space and and take the reins of exploration. Uh, we have a, a newfound, for example, we have a young team, and it's really nice to see some young geologists come in and do good science. And uh, I'm, you know, I think there is a future in the mining industry, even though sometimes a lot of people look and they think it's a bunch of gray hair. You know, there's actually good work being done. And I think this next round of discoveries is going to be impressive. Yeah. And uh, in closing here, uh, uh, Quentin, I appreciate your, your taking the time here. Um, uh, to your point here of uh, maybe not the gray hairs or maybe getting this crowd a little younger, let's build a message here for the younger investor who doesn't quite understand what a you know, mad scientist like yourself sees um, below the earth. But you put that message to their the technology they have. Nothing really exists without mining. So, what uh, I guess I guess what advice would you give them in trying to find good companies and tell them how important your craft is uh, to survive? Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, to be very blunt, if uh, if the small pool of of exploration geologists and and miners who we have in this industry weren't around basically civilization would not have all the, the luxuries it does today. Everything, everything that you have in your possession either has to be mined or grown. I mean, it's that simple. And uh, you know, a lot of people look at mining, they think, Oh, it's, it's an industry that's destructive. It's uh, not environmentally friendly and stuff. I, I counter that by saying, you know what, uh, these metals and stuff that we're producing are actually uh, the the ingredients we need to to make the world a better place, and uh, I think that mindset has got to shift. I would really like to see a lot of young people, uh, both people who might be interested in coming into this space and invest in this space, to kind of reconsider this negative stigma around mining. I think that uh, you know if you dig a little deeper and you ask harder questions of yourself, you know what is important. Well. Uh, look, you want to make a difference in the world if you think that, uh, you know, you, your personal views around the environment and so forth, uh, you know, mining companies shouldn't adhere to those. Guess what? Put your money to work. Okay. 
put your put your skills to work. Go to work for a mining company. If you want to make a difference environmentally, best place to make it is to go to work in the mining industry. Okay, you, you can go in there and have a, a serious impact. Or if you want to invest, you can invest in the companies you feel are doing the best job at ESG or, or whatever. I mean, these are these are certainly considerations people can make. And you know, I think that there is room for the younger generation to really step up here. Everybody's going to need stuff going forward. There's no question. Okay, just to, to make blanket statements like all of mining is bad or all of the oil industry is bad is absolutely ridiculous. You know, let's all work together. Let's figure out how to make get these resources that we need and make the world a better place. Okay. Well said. It's Dr. Quentin Henning. He hangs his hat at Crestcat Capital. Dr. Quentin Henning, appreciate you taking the time here and uh, we'll look forward to treasure hunting with you as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob.